homework and you will see the video. Should have no excuse. Okay, so RNA is single stranded. Good. Number two, anybody? Right, eukaryotes are, are going to be talking about the, I'm only found in the nucleus, so that's going to be what's in the nucleus. We all know it's DNA. Eukaryotes have a nucleus, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, but do they have DNA? Yes. Yes, they still have DNA, it's just not hidden in the nucleus. Good. Nucleic acid? Both of them are NA, DNA, that's what the NA stands for, nucleic acid. Good job. Uh, number four, what did you guys say? DNA. DNA, double helix, good. Have sugar ribose, RNA. Rib ribose is what the R stands for in RNA. What does the D stand for in DNA? Deoxyribose, right. All right, six, oh, <laughs> deoxyribose, DNA, good. Seven includes guanine, cytosine, and adenine. Both, right. So that one's actually going to, you know, those are the three that are the similar ones between the both DNA and RNA. Um, number eight, in eukaryotic cells, I travel out of the nucleus to a ribosome. RNA. RNA. Specifically, which of the three types of RNA is going to be moving from the nucleus to the ribosome? mRNA. Right, mRNA is the one that is the messenger. Good job. Number nine, I have thymine. DNA, right, no, RNA does not have a T. Instead, it has U for your cell. Good job. So there are some similar similarities and there are some differences. The next thing on the very bottom of the sheet, there's a little chart where you're talking about the three types of RNA. So, and we'll do this other part in a second together. Down at the very bottom, what did the M stand for, for mRNA? Messenger. Messenger and what does it look like? Right, it's a straight line and it had like little nucleotides like this on it. Cool. Okay. Um, which one is was called or what's the abbreviation for uh, transfer RNA? Mm -hmm. tRNA. And what does it look like? Kind of like a T-ish. I mean, it's not exactly T, but kind of looks like this. Kinda looks like that. Some people call it like a, four, a three leaf clover. It depends on how it's drawn. But it looks like that. It's got um, like three things in the bottom and it's got something on the top. What is it carrying around on the top that's used to make a protein? Right, the amino acids being carried around. And then this bottom piece will base pair with the first codon or a codon on the mRNA. So what is this right here called? Anti codon. Good, because the T and anti codon go together. Good. Uh, last one. R RNA and what does it look like or where is it located? What does the R stand for? Ribosomal. Good. Ribosomal RNA. So where does it exist? It makes up part of the ribosome. That one's really easy because it's like I'm ribosome RNA because I make up the ribosome. And so it looks like this. Here's the top part of the ribosome. That's the R RNA and then there's this little piece in the bottom. Looks like a Oh, it's like the like the mushroom person from Mario Brothers. Yeah, toad, toad. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. That's what it looks like. I used to love Mario Kart. Okay. Pokemon Snapchat. Yeah. Snap. Yes. I mean, I got so many good pictures of Pokemon. Pikachu and Charizard. Yeah, all that stuff. Okay. So let's get back to DNA. <laughs> Okay, we did transcription Monday. We're going to do translation today, but remind me what transcription entailed and what it did. So we know transcription is the first phase. Okay, so first phase or stage or whatever you want to call it of protein synthesis. Protein synthesis only has got two steps, right? So first thing we have to do is go sneaky like a ninja into the nucleus and look at it. We got to look at the code. Who is responsible for, well, first of all, let's answer this question. Where is this process located? Assuming a eukaryotic cell. Right, and I just said that. We're going to be sneaky going into the nucleus. Because the nucleus contains the DNA, right. And that's what we need to see in order to look at the genes and the genetic code. All right, so who is the sneaky ninja going into the nucleus and looking at the, the genes? mRNA. So mRNA, I'm oh, sorry, uh, which types of RNA are directly? It's already answered there for us, so mRNA is good. Um, is DNA directly involved in the process, this first phase? Definitely. Because if not, you can't, you can't, you don't know what you're looking at. DNA has to be involved because it's holding the genetic code. Good. All right, so any other pieces, any of those three uh, RNA 
possibilities. Are there any other ones that are involved in this first process? No, no RNA or rRNA and no tRNA just yet. So yes, the mRNA goes in there and you can see it right here. The DNA is a double helix. This is the, the, the mRNA strand or transcript like we call it is that's being made. All right, so what was the purpose or end result and purpose of this first step? Not replication to per se. To make a copy of what? A gene. Okay, we want to make a copy of the gene, but not a direct copy like, oh, it's A to T and, you know, T to, T to A, C to G, G to C. Not that direct, because that would be DNA replication. We have to make a copy of, of a gene, but in the RNA version, which we call a transcript. Okay, cool. That's what we talked about last week. I mean, I keep saying last week. You know what I mean. Monday. Yesterday felt like the weekend. All right, yeah. so let's go ahead. Let's see what we do. Let's finish translation notes. We've got two slides left in the video. Uh, we're going to take a couple. We're going to watch a video on mutations and take, I think it's like two slides on mutation notes. Finish our activity that we started last, or Monday. And if we can, I would like to get to this mutation lemonade lab. It's really fun. So work with me. We'll be good, okay? So here we go. Let's finish translation notes first. Keep that worksheet on your desk because we are going to use it at about 20 minutes. We already went from DNA to RNA, so check, check. We've got these taken care of. Last thing we want to do is finalize the process by finally making the protein. That's the goal of all this stuff we've been talking about. So translation, um, I highlighted the L here because the way I've remembered it since I was your age, the, the two steps. The first step was called what? This is the second step. First step was called transcription, right? Transcription. And the second step is called translation. I remember the order of it because, you know, when you're saying transcription, translation, blah, 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 it gets jumbled up. I remember the order because C comes before L in the alphabet. So transcript, translate. So the L comes second. That's how I remember the order. All right, so now we're going to talk about finally making that protein. But proteins come, they don't come as one big honk and piece. They're made of little tiny subunits, Legos, that we call amino acids. So actually what translation is, it's a process of making the amino acid sequence from the sneaky messenger mRNA. All right, so you got the end goal, right? This is the end goal of translation. Where does it happen? When does it happen? Where? Well, you know the organelle that makes proteins, that, that synthesis of proteins one was a site or was the ribosome and that ribosome exists floating around in the cytoplasm. So that's the where. And when, it can't happen until mRNA is totally made. So it has to happen after transcription. So that's kind of like the, we know that. It has to happen after transcription. The transcription is going on like all the time. So that's no big deal. It's happening right here in the body. You're making something to... You're gonna make a protein probably get to get yourself up in a second, you know, to activate your muscle fibers to make, make yourself get up like an enzyme. And I have in here, it's probably hard to see in that pink right there, uh, the, the term that we use to represent a bunch of amino acids strung together, we can either say protein, or we can say polypeptide <coughs> chain. So polypeptide, poly means many, Peptides were those peptide bonds that held the amino acids together. So those two things are used interchangeably. I just don't want you to forget that because if I ever say, uh, what's the process called uh, or what's the second step of making a polypeptide, you're like, what the heck is a polypeptide? I want you to remember that. It just means protein. Okay, so these first steps you're going to see are going to look scary. I'm going to abbreviate them on the whiteboard right here, okay? So you already know the, a lot of this stuff, but I'm going to read through it first. Don't write anything yet. You see the first step is take the mRNA. Look at it, go to the ribosome, find the start part, start kit on. You already knew that, right? From last week. 
or Monday. TRNA is going to go look at the amino acid codon. It's going to base pair it with the anticodon. With the tRNA comes an amino acid. Well, that's pretty easy. We knew that. Then it's going to keep going. The tRNAs are just going to keep pumping themselves through until all the amino acids are brought to the ribosome. Then something tells it to stop. That was that stop codon we talked about that says, okay, done. We're done with transcription and translation. And then the amino acid chain or the protein is going to, you know, come off and fold into its particular shape. So let's abbreviate this into a little bit smaller version. So step one. mRNA goes to ribosome. My marker is getting a little low here. And I'm just going to put in parentheses start codon. What was that start codon? It's an easy, cheesy way to remember it. AUG, right, August. We start school in August, so we start it here. Start codon AUG. All right, two. Now we're at the ribosome. Now the tRNA is capable of coming to meet it. So I'm going to say tRNA um, matches, or I'm going to say bonds, bonds with mRNA codon to bring AA, amino acid. So let me try to abbreviate the best I can. These are, these are ones you probably want to write down. So we got the mRNA there. The mRNA contains all those codons. tRNA is going to come and bond with the mRNA. And I didn't write the word anticodon up here, but you know the tRNA contains the anticodon. I'll write it there really little for just in case you, you forget. All right, so it's going to keep doing that over and over and over again. Just different tRNAs, or tRNAs are going to come in there bringing different amino acids. They're going to do that until they see something that says stop. So I'm just going to write continues until stop codon. Do you have your stop codons listed on your paper someplace? What's one of them, Alex? UAA. Okay, I'm just going to write that one example. UAA. All right, so now we're to the part where it's like, okay, translation is done. Now let's just finalize the whole protein part, and then we're, then we're just going to break down everything and let it come back together when we need to do protein synthesis again. So that's where we are right here. Step four continues until stop codons. We just put that right here together. Step two, step three, and step four together. But the last part, something new. Amino acid chain breaks off and forms the 3D folds to form the 3D protein structure that we know we know proteins form. Remember your little Pac-Man example of enzymes? Like you had a, here's our enzyme. An enzyme is just a protein. And the substrate has to fit right into it. Substrate. So that's why we have to pull the proteins in a very particular way because they have a special job they do. And they don't work with just everything out in the body. They work with something special, their individual substrate. So fourth step I'm going to write right here is amino, or I'm going to say protein. chain folds into into 3D structure. Because that shape that that protein takes is going to control its function. It's going to control its ability to do its job. And proteins have really, really, really important jobs in our body. So we have to let them fold to their appropriate way. Very last step, that pretty much means everything just breaks down. So. The ribosome and the mRNA break down. They just break into little pieces, and those, those small subunits are just going to go float around, not doing anything. They're just floating around until they need to be used again. And the tRNA is going to do the same thing. tRNA is going to go back to the cytoplasm and chill. It's going to go find another amino acid to go, you know, bond with. But it's not going to go, let's go bring it to the, to the ribosome, because nobody's telling it, no, no nucleus or anything is instructing it to do protein synthesis. So I'm just going to say step five, breakdown. Everything breaks down. Breaks down. And that's kind of summarizes that. And if you remember, breaks down means everything, mRNA, protein, and tRNA, which is allowing the process to kind of stop for a little while and start back up whenever you need it to. All right, so that sounds really long, but we talked about all those pieces a lot Monday. Are we okay on like reading and understanding what this whole process is? 
let's look at a video to look, kind of solidify it here. Um, not that one. Where's my video? Okay, go ahead and take a seat for me. My video is here. All right, this one is not the one exactly I want to show you, but we'll go with this one. And I have to stop Pandora. It's going to be loud. All right, here we go. A transfer RNA molecule is composed of about 75 nucleotides. Each transfer RNA molecule recognizes only one amino acid, which becomes bonded to the top of the transfer RNA molecule. Located on the bottom of the transfer RNA molecule are three nitrogen bases called an anticodon that pair up with messenger RNA codons during translation. As translation begins, the first codon of the messenger RNA strand attaches to a ribosome. Then, transfer RNA molecules, each carrying a specific amino acid, approach the ribosome. All right, so what's that first one called again? No, the very first one right here. Start codon. So if AUG is here, what's the anticodon? UAC. Good, and that's the big T here names carrying the amino acid with it. Where's this, what's this blue bubble thing? Ribosome, good job. When the transfer RNA anticodon pairs with the messenger RNA codon, the two molecules join. Often, the first codon on messenger RNA is AUG, which codes for the amino acid methionine. AUG signals the start of protein synthesis. The messenger RNA then slides along the ribosome to the next codon, where a new transfer RNA molecule carrying an amino acid will pair with the messenger RNA codon. The two adjoining amino acids then become joined by a peptide bond, and the first transfer RNA molecule is released by the messenger RNA. As the process continues, a chain of amino acids is formed until the ribosome reaches a stop codon on the messenger RNA strand. All right, so what would happen after the, after the amino acid chain broke off? What's the next step? It folds into its 3D shape, and then what? Everything breaks down except for the protein you just made. Like, that would be dumb if you broke down the protein because it takes a lot of work to get there. Okay, um, I'm going to go back and show you a couple of pictures here. So, here, we just talk, saw that pretty much exactly. Um, this is just showing you the differences between all the shapes because I don't want you to look at something and go, I don't know what that is because you don't remember the shape. See a double helix, you know it's DNA. DNA. Good. If you see a straight line, you know it's mRNA. Good. If you see a curly Q thing with some circles hanging off of it, tRNA, the big blue thing in the back is the ribosome. Um, so that's pretty much it on the different shapes. I don't want you to forget those. Um, oops, wrong way. All right, um, I'm going to skip that for now. Let's finish up that one part of the worksheet, that very last part. And then continuation video, I guess we'll do the first time, so I don't have to talk about it now. All right, so on your warm-up sheet where you were writing down all the information we went through together. Let's do this one together too. So it's the last part of the first page of the warm-up. Okay, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so you can see the tRNA. Uh, you can see the protein, the uh, ribosome down here. Uh, what's the, what's number 18 column saying? Where is this, this process located? Where, this is translation we're talking about. Ribosome. Right, ribosome. And then that's in the cytoplasm. Good. All right. Um, and then this one's already answered for us. Is DNA directly involved here? No. No, because DNA is in the nucleus. We're at the ribosome. It's not directly contacting what we're talking about. The messenger, though, the mRNA definitely is. So the mRNA is the appropriate nucleotide structure we're talking about here. Uh, oh, which types of RNA are involved? Messenger. What else? Transfer. Any more? Why, why ribo, or you're talking about the R? Our RNA is ribosomal RNA. Is that one involved here? Yeah. Yeah, because it's like at the ribosome, so it has to be involved. It's not like I'm a, you know, the star of the show, look at me, look at me. It's just kind of in the background going, all right, on the ribosome, this is where everything takes place. So it makes it part of the ribosome. That's why that's important. All right, so cool. All of the mRNA, or all the RNA types are involved here. Last one, end result. End result is making a, right, make a amino acid 
chain, also known as a protein, also known as a polypeptide chain. I know you can read that, but that's a polypeptide chain. Okay. While I move to mutation video, 30 second stretch break, get up. Get up and stretch. I don't want no sleepy faces. Not allowed. Yes, ma'am. So I'm gonna leave, I'll make it big for you. Polypeptide chain. <laughs> Sorry. KK. information and we're going to watch the Amoeba Sisters because I love them. They're super fun. If this is a read, this worksheet is a recap of the mutation video. So you might want to look at this for a minute so you can see what you're looking for and then we're going to have to review it together at the end. But I need you to be looking for what these answers are. So take about 30 seconds to a minute to look at that worksheet to see what they're future and the terminology they're looking for. They're actually on both it's both sides because it's one's uh, gene mutations and one's chromosome mutations. All right, so we're looking for things like single substitutions, point mutations, harmful, helpful nucleotide sequences. We're going to finish those. And then over on the other side, it says, remember, you know, you're be putting a, an X on these two statements. So look at those. It's not real point to the Okay. 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 I recommend you pay attention so you can what get questions. What do you think of when you think of the word mutation? Do you think about X-Men and some really awesome ability? Or the Ninja Turtles? We loved the Ninja Turtles when we were little. We might be showing our age a little bit. But mutations really are not that glamorous. Most people understand that a mutation is some kind of change. It is a change of genetic material, and more specifically, a nucleic acid. RNA and DNA, they're both types of nucleic acids. So how does a change happen? Remember that in DNA, the base adenine, A, goes with the base thymine, T, and the base cytosine, C, goes with the base guanine, G. And that's all good, but what happens if the wrong base matches up? Many things can cause an error like that. There can be external factors, like chemicals and radiation, internal. Okay, we need to know these. What are things that can cause mutations? Um, chemicals, radiation. Okay, so chemicals, radiation. Radiation, okay, and? Things too, like something goes wrong during DNA replication, during interphase. Interphase is a stage that prepares cells to divide during mitosis. And now while these things can increase the chance that a mutation is going to happen, it's important to understand that mutations, they're random. If a mutation is going to be a helpful thing for an organism, which is rare, very few mutations are actually helpful, it can't just will itself to get that mutation. An organism can't just will itself to get this. It's definitely not like X-Men either. And more about that when we get to natural selection. Many mutations are actually neutral in their effect. So as I'm listening, I'm writing down just a couple of things I hear that they're emphasizing. Try that too, because then that we're answering the answers in the work worksheet will be super fast. And that's a good way if you ever watch a video, take notes so you don't have to rewatch re rewatch the video over and over and over again, because that way that's a waste of your time. This is easier. Right. Meaning they neither help nor harm an organism. And some mutations are harmful. So we're going to talk about the different kinds of mutations. First, we're going to talk about gene mutations. 
So DNA makes up genes, and genes code for proteins that influence or make up different traits. So when DNA has changes, otherwise known as a mutation, then different proteins can be produced, and this can affect an organism's traits. So let's look at the gene mutations. So first, substitution. That means you have the wrong base matched. So instead of A with T, you could put A with G. Scandalous. You can have insertion. That means an extra base is added in. You can have deletion. That means a base is removed. Insertions and deletions have the potential to be especially dangerous. Because remember, in protein synthesis, we talked about how bases are read in threes. Well, if you add a base or remove a base, suddenly the number of bases total has changed, right? So if you... So this first one, we uh, this is the normal A, T, A, G, C, A, T, G, A. Normal strand. What happened right here with this A? Um, well, no, it's not taken out. Do you see what it, what, it's still like A, A, ooh. Now, instead of it being a T, they have inserted, like, put it, like, somebody butted in line, in lunch line, and they've added a whole extra person to the line. Where are you at? Right, I'm, I'm right here, pointing to this A right here. And that's, a, don't worry about the works here now, look up here, it's totally fine. So, you see that this A was intruded, it's, it's inserted there. And then continue. You see, um, the T, A, G, C, A, T, A, G, C, A, T, G, A, T, G, but now that last A is booted off to the next codon. So, how many codons do we have here? Three. three. We have three, three plus one plus extra one, one right? Yeah. That means that this first, you know, this is going to be eventually an mRNA codon. So, A, T, A will go to what for mRNA? Um, mRNA. A would pair with U. U. T would pair with A, and then A would pair with U. U. So be U A U, right? Well, this one's not going to be U A U. This one's going to be U U U U T. I mean U U A U A. So we're going to have a big, huge mistake in our codon, which would be a mistake in our amino acid, and then that shifted all the way down. It messed up everything past it. Okay. This one, on the other hand, we said A T A cool A T A. A, I'm sorry, G, C, A, G, C, A. It has a T on it. T on it. So that, it. Well, like, the, is that extra to that? Is it G? That's what we're going to, I'm going to finish this. I'll stop it too early so it's not actually, it's not actually done yet. Let me just finish this back up. You read in threes, depending on where it happened, everything that's read afterwards has the potential to get really messed up. We call this a phrase, depending on where it happened, everything that's read afterwards has the potential to get really messed up. We call this a frame shift. Now, so on this one they removed, it was a G, C, A. That C right there actually has an X through it. It's really hard to see, so pretend it's not there. So it would be G, A, T. And so that deletion caused the other, other uh, nucleotides to shift forward. That's where we're missing one at the end. There was a deletion of that C, but they, the X is just hard to see on that one. But they can't have it like A, T, A, then G, A, and then T, G. No, it has to be in threes. That's how the mRNA codons are read. Mm -hmm. So what it's saying, though, if you insert something or delete something, the whole thing is screwed up. Totally awful. Everything's going to be wrong after that point. Heads up. Let's go. Heads up. Like heads off the desk. That would, that's what that means. Thank you. These were all types of gene mutations, but we also have something called chromosome mutations. Remember that chromosomes are made up of DNA and protein. They're highly organized and they have a lot of genes on them. So all of the body cells in your body have 46 chromosomes. Human sperm and egg cells have 23 chromosomes. Well, changes can occur at that large chromosome scale too. So let's talk about these chromosome mutations. Just like insertion in a gene mutation where bases got added, you can also have something called duplication in chromosomes. These are mutations where extra copies of genes are generated. So extra You remember that? Oh, you yeah. went over this one already. Okay, the next one. Extra copies of that chromosome are generated. There's deletion. That's where some of the genetic material from the chromosome breaks off. Inversion. That's when a broken chromosome segment gets inversed. That means it gets reversed and put back on the chromosome or translocation. We were not kidding back when we said there's a lot of trans words in biology. 
That's when a fragment from one chromosome breaks off and attaches to another chromosome. There's more mutations than what we just covered, but the idea here is there are many kinds of different changes that can happen. If a mutation is going to happen, there's also some vulnerable times, like when DNA replication happens during interphase, and also other times too, like meiosis. Remember in humans, meiosis produces sperm and egg cells that have 23 chromosomes. But sometimes those chromosomes, when they're separating, they don't separate completely. We call this non-disjunction. This results in an egg or sperm that has too many or too few chromosomes. And that can cause a genetic disorder depending on which chromosome. Where is the problem at in this karyotype? Mm -hmm. Well, there's 22 pairs, but then that 23rd pair is your sex chromosome set. That's what, that's fine. What do you see that's wrong? 18. So what would you call that? That's uh, trisomy 18. Trisomy 21 is Down syndrome, right? Yes. Trisomy 18. I had to look this up. It's Edward syndrome, which means that that person will have mal um, malformations of their body and their face, and not be able to speak, and normally they die within the first year of life. So Down syndrome is so highly like publicized and common because most of the time those people don't die. They just contain, you know, they have problems with their brain wirings, they have some other uh, disformations in the face, but they live, they're fine. They're not going to, they're not deadly or anything. This one is deadly for a trisomy 18. That's why we don't, I, we're like, what the heck is trisomy 18? I had to look it up because nobody knows what it is because these people don't live. So when we're talking about different chromosomes contain different genes. So the specific chromosome that's affected, that really does make a difference in the result. And let's talk about some real life examples okay. now. Of I'm holding off on this one for a second because those are we've already talked about sickle cell. So on your worksheet, I'm going to go there. Oops, not there now. We're going to answer some of these together. Okay, so I'm going to cut the light on this. Yeah. Yep, different diseases. Okay, mutations can be harmful, helpful, which is sometimes unlikely, or neutral in their effect. Often a neutral mutation will not change the amino acid that it codes for. Using your mRNA codon chart, give another mRNA codon that this CUU could mutate to and still call for the same amino acid. So what it's asking us to do is look at the amino acid codon chart we looked at last week. The roller coaster. Here we go. All right, looking here. C U U. Do you see it? C U. Michael. Shut up. All right. So you see C U. So we're looking in this quadrant here, and then U right here. All right. So here's the one we were talking about. C U U. What else? What other mRNA codon could you be looking for? It mutate to, but still calls for leucine. C U C C U A. All right, hold on, hold on. So C U U is the first one. C U A C C C U A C U A C U G C U G. So any of those? Thank you. Any of those are going to be calling for the same exact up U, here. U and A. Well, there. These are all. Yeah, you could go to other ones, but it said just one mutation. So just that U was changed to, to C, A, or G. So that's the beauty of the amino acid codon chart because I can have a mutation, no problem. My, my amino acid is still gonna be exactly the same thing. So that's a good thing about if we, cause you know, uh, that enzyme that proofreads after DNA is replicated, it's gonna proofread, but like when you have 3 million bases you're running through, it's probably gonna miss a typo. Okay, it's probably gonna still have at least one typo. It happens. So that's good because if we have a typo, we have an accidental DNA mutation, we can still not, not have a problem in our phenotype. And that's, that's like the uh, safety switch there. All right, so back over here, we said the mRNA CUU codon could mutate to CUC, CUG, CUA, anything like that. And still code for leucine, which would be neutral mutation, no harm at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does that make sense on this side? Yeah. This side of the room? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anything lower? No, okay. So, it's important to understand that mutations, a specific part of the nucleic acid experiences a mutation. In the below cartoon, fill in the blank that describes the part of the DNA molecule that is experiencing the mutation, then label where that part is found in the DNA in the picture. So, you don't have to do the picture part, but what's changing here? 
things. The bases, right. The bases or the nucleotide nucleotide bases, if that's what you want to call it, too. Cool. Okay, this part is the, the part where I want to go through. Um, before we do that part, let me go back here. Before we do this part, so hold it on your paper. I want you to write down this. Point and frame shift. Yep, point and frame shift, because those are what they talk about. So we talk about a little bit more first. I think that next part will make more sense. And I'll scroll down for you for the uh, frame shift. Do you need to write it in any particular place in your notes? Finish your paper activities and do your lemonade lab, which I love. Mm -hmm. My mom called my sister my sissies all the time. It's not a negative word. My mom also calls my dog sissy. My mom also calls my sister my mom sissy. She does that all the time. She's weird. What? Okay. All right, so mutations we know is a DNA change in the sequence, which is just pretty much saying a base is changed. You guys know delta? The symbol triangle delta. Oh yeah. That means to change. That's that's easy way to write change. We're just writing C H A N G. Okay. So the first type that we're talking about is up just a point, just a single point. One second. Single point is going to be substituted where you may or may not have a change in the amino acid. We'll see. So um, if I had C U C. No, let's we just did that one. Let's go through different. Somebody, G -G -G. somebody give me something else. G, G, G. G, G, G. That would be my normal codon from the mRNA. Now, point mutated. One nucleotide gets to change. C, G. G. C, C, G. G. Okay, so just the middle one changed. Let's go back in just a second. I'll go back. Let's go back and see what this codon amino acid coded for. And then we're going to see what this one coded for. And let's see if that made a difference. It might, it might not. I have no idea. we got to go back and see. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so it says that it does all it does this always change for an AAA code for subtle mutation. And I'm going to tell you what that means in a second. That's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. All right, so single mutated. Let's go see what GGG stands for. GGG. GGG. What do you guys see? G, G. I'm going to see if I can make this. It stands for glycine. glycine. So G, where's the other G? The last mm. row, so we're over here. Mm. I'm just making sure we, we see that the, the both G's correlated to this quadrant, and then we said, okay, last G, so glycine. All right, so glycine is what our GGG stands for. What did GCG stand for? It stands for? G is in the bottom row, where's the C? It's right there, the, the second, second row. Second column. And G so you're here. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Alanine. Alanine. Okay, so did that point mutation change your amino acids? It yes. is. It definitely did. So that one caused a mutation. That mutation could be bad. It could be neutral. It could be it could be good. Maybe it made maybe having alanine as that amino acid made you like a super fast runner where the other one was like you were slow as molasses. I have no idea. It depends on where it's at. But if you have, if you know that the amino acid is changing, that's important. What if instead of going GCG, we went from GGG to GGU? What would GGU stand for? Steel glycine, right? It would be up here. So we'd be okay. Now, if it's calling for the same exact amino acid and it, it's neutral, we sometimes call that a silent mutation because it doesn't really change anything in the end. No. No, if it, if it doesn't really change anything in, in the end because the amino acid is a thing, we call it a silent mutation because it doesn't end up causing any harm or any good, really. So, back here, 
Does it always change the amino acid? No, but it can. Okay, so this one was glycine and this one was alanine. And silent mutation is whenever you have, have the same amino acid that it's coded for. All right, Ooh. second one. The type that you had where you caused a shift either way in the big stranded codons, that's called a frame shift mutation. And that's where we had an insertion. So nucleotide is inserted, insertion, or a nucleotide is deleted, so removed. So instead of having G, I'm just gonna go across the board here, G, 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 C, G. Maybe that was our normal mRNA codon. Give me an example of an insertion of this. Um, G, no C, G. Insertion, okay. insert something new, totally okay, new. G, U, G. Okay, so you're gonna insert right here, right in the middle here, she's, she's inserted a U. So now everybody tell me what happens after that. It'll still be C and G, right? This is, no, we gotta finish up this. C. So the G stays here, and then this one goes. Right there. Next, and then this one goes. G. Next, and then we have C. Oops, that's not a G, that's a C. All right, and then what happens to this last one? It's by itself. It's at the end. So now we have an insertion. Now, there's more, there's more uh, nucleotides huh? and stuff past this. There's more, so it's gonna make a huge change in the end. I'm only looking at two codons right now, but there's like millions. But that's an insertion, and that caused the whole thing past this part right here to be screwed up. Now, same thing could happen, but with a deletion, where instead of putting a new one there, you just like maybe eliminate that G, and everything shifts to the left that way. So it will be no extra letter. Right, you'd only have two in the end here. Okay, so an example of this is cystic, um, not cystic fibrosis, um, it is actually, but sickle cell is what I really want to focus on. We talked about sickle cell anemia, and we talked about how it had those sickle-shaped shaped blood cells that carried less, less oxygen, right? This one right here is caused by a substitution mutation. That is an important fact to know. So what happens, I can't remember which chromosome it's on right now, but if somebody's uh, DNA said A, T, G, normal all that happens is they have instead of atg they have a u i'm uh, not u let's do a c g a c g so it's pretty much the same it's just that middle nucleotide was substituted for something else and that one mutation that one change made this person have single uh, single cell anemia so sometimes they can be very detrimental all right, and you already know translocation, duplication, inversion, and deletion. Do I need to review those? No. Okay, no. Thank you. All right, what I'd like for you to do, oh, I've got to talk about antibiotics, and that's it. Okay, so who's ever heard of antibiotic resistance? I've heard of it. Antibiotics? Okay, you've heard of it. What do you take antibiotics for? For, like, bacterial, bacterial infections. You can't take antibiotics for viral infections. Right, well, because viruses uh, have a different cell membrane and so it's hard to attack them with the same yeah. chemicals you attack. Oh, don't laugh because it's not funny. Okay, so antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infection. Alright, so what happens is who becomes resistant to the antibiotics? You or the bacteria? Yeah. You. Who is the what is the antibiotic Fighting, fighting the you, it's fighting the bacteria. So who's going to become resistant, resistant against it? Bacteria. The bacteria. Right. People all the time are like, oh yeah, that antibiotic doesn't work for me. I'm resistant to it. No, your body ain't got nothing to do with those antibiotics. The bacteria are what's being attacked by the antibiotics. So what happens is, little bacteria here, this little happy face. There's our bacteria. They replicate like like bunny rabbits. Okay, they repli replicate like crazy. And this is, if this one makes another baby, I'm gonna draw a happy face too, but they have a slightly different DNA, like one thing mutated, that antibiotic that would could possibly kill this one, so cross eyes, okay, there we go. If it could kill that one, the antibiotic that you know could it's targeting the normal version of the of the uh, DNA of that bacteria, the the Antibiotic will see this one, which is slightly different, just one mutation, and the antibiotic can't do anything about it. It can't kill it at all. So 
what happens is people take antibiotics for how many days? For like five, five to 14 days. Usually it's a week to two weeks, right? When you are, let's say, five or six days and you're like, oh, I'm feeling good. I don't need to finish the rest of this knee pack or whatever antibiotics you get. You just stop taking them. Well, it's killed off the majority of the, of the bacteria in your body. There's still a couple stragglers in there. So after you're done taking, you just say, I'm done. I'm, I'm feeling good. I don't need to finish off this antibiotics. Your body's just going to say, your, your bacteria's going to say, oh, man, they're not taking any more. Let's go ahead and have a party, reproduction party. They make, 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 make more of the bacteria in your body. The ones that survived, though, were the ones that were resistant and weren't killed for the first five days. So then those are just going to be chilling in your body, and then you're like, oh, those are good again. So you go back and you try to finish up those like you know, the last five days of your antibiotic. Well, if those are the ones that were resistant to it. Do you think that that antibiotic is going to kill them now? No. No. So then you're going to be saying, well, antibiotic's not working, doctor. I don't know what I did. So what happened is you let those bacteria survive and then, you know, have no chemicals in your body and they just reproduce like crazy. So that's where we get the term MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Methicillin is a bacteria. I'm sorry, methicillin is, a, is an antibiotic. Staphylococcus aureus is just staph. Who, who's heard of a staph infection? Okay. Staph infection? Wrestlers get them all the time because you guys are really like sweaty on the mat and stuff. But I was telling you my first year, three years ago, four years ago, they got a staph infection in their bone. Like they went through a they went through a cut, they went to their, their blood, they went to their bone. Once it gets in your blood and your bone, you're a big dude. Because it's now going around your body through your circulatory system like crazy. And the antibiotics don't really work as well if it's that far spread out. Very low class infections it works very well with. So they tried to treat it with methicillin, like penicillin or any of those other ampicillin. Those are all some chronic antibiotics. Methicillin didn't do crap to it because it's methicillin resistant. It does not, you keep throwing methicillin at it, it's like, can't touch this because it's not going to die. So they have to find other antibiotics to try to treat it. So it's a problem. Yes, I'll give you two questions. Huh? What is it? Just the bacteria? Staph? Uh, symptoms are usually fever. Um, it'll probably kill and destroy a lot of your organs, organic cells. And there's a couple other things. Like it, it's, it produces toxins which kill your cells. That's the, like the general sense of it. Yes. Okay, since so you're taking antibiotics, but like if it doesn't go the first like first time you take it and then you stop, even if you continue, you're just giving yourself medicine. Like because if it was what happens it, though when it doesn't kill the first, if it doesn't kill one bacteria the first time, that one bacteria might eventually run out of food and run out of resources and die by itself. Maybe not die by the hands of the antibiotic, but die by itself, one bacteria. But when you stop taking it, that one bacteria multiplies to a million, three million, five million, 15 million bacteria. Then it's out of control and your body's like, I can't do anything about this. I don't know what to do. It's harder for those that many to, to degrade. One, mm -hmm. no big deal, but a million or 15 million, big deal. Okay, so that's essentially what this is. Oh, I was gonna show you my example. Have you ever heard of ulcers, stomach ulcers? No. Okay, no, maybe some people have heard of them. Okay, you get stomach ulcers from this bacteria called Helicobacter pylori. And what happened was a scientist was like, oh, like back in the 1800s, everybody was like, oh, you get stomach ulcers from having too much stress in your life. And you just get an ulcer because people say, if you stress out too much, you get ulcer. And the scientist was like, pretty sure that's not how you get ulcer. I'll prove it. So he, he had this helicobacter pylori, which is a, just a specific, this shape bacteria. And he drank a culture of it. He just drank it. He's like, I'm going to prove to you people it's not from stress. It's literally from bacteria. So he drank it and he got ulcers, not from stress, but from the helico helicobacter pylori. So he actually did an experiment on himself and people were like, you're crazy, dude. But he ended up showing a big uh, improvement in disease studies and like how diseases are, are, inher are not inherited, how diseases are spread. So Helicobacter pylori, if you treat it with antibiotic, which people with stomach ulcers will take this, um, it normally would kill it. But if that Helicobacter pylori has a mutation, it has a mutation that says, can't touch me, that antibiotic won't work on it. So it's like, yeah, ha, 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 and I'll make more. And then that's when you have problems. So they continue to reproduce and produce offspring that also contain that mutation, because you know they, they make identical babies to themselves. And that's why we end up having resistance to antibiotics. So we'll talk more about that later. 
here's what I'd like to do. We have about 35 minutes. You guys are going to finish. We'll finish this other stuff later. Um, where are my instructions? Sorry, I typed up instructions for us and everything. Aha, here we go. All right, your strands that you started last week, they look kind of like this. You're going to finish those with the transcription part. Um, I do want to make a note. The transcription part is the first step. That's when you're making your mRNA strand. If you tape it to the purple strand, so if you tape it or glue it to this right here, make sure your nucleotide bases are touching. The sugar does not touch the A or the T or the G or whatever. Okay? After you get done, you're going to have a big strand of mRNA here. You're going to cut it off. So it's own set of strands. DNA we're done with. The DNA does not travel south of the nucleus. Your mRNA strand, you're going to look at the DNA uh, genetic code, that chart, and you're going to translate that to amino acids. So the amino acids have, I have little circles to represent those, and you guys just have to write it in the correct way. So when you get done with that, you're just going to take some a paper, a page of this, and then write your amino acids, and then tape those together. So after you've done with that, I'll let you guys start taking the names out, okay? So work hard. Uh, the stuff's back here, glue and tape as you need it, okay? So back with your partner. <laughs>